and welcome to Wicked Women, the podcast. I'm your host, Grace Beatty. Today's episode is going to be a little different than what I usually do. I'm going to be uploading the entire interview that I conducted with historian Dr. Eleanor Janega. In addition, I'm not going to be talking about only a single woman, but about a role they have occupied for centuries, that of the royal mistress. Eleanor is a leading expert on the conceptualization of sex and sexuality throughout the medieval and early modern period. We will be discussing the historical role of the royal mistress, misconceptions, and some of the most iconic women to have received that title. With that content in mind, I'm also giving a warning to listeners. Eleanor and I do not shy away from discussing the more sexual role performed by the royal mistress. With that warning out of the way, join me and Eleanor as we discuss the role and legacy of the royal mistress. Thank you so much for agreeing to meet me. Honestly, I'm such a huge fan of yours. And- oh my God, that is so kind. Oh, I'm blushing. Oh. <laughs> So, you know, I, I'm very excited about this episode, sort of getting into mistresses and royal mistresses throughout history. It's one of those things that I started doing individual episodes on certain mistresses. And then it's like, I realize we should just talk about this role in general. It is such a role throughout history and each country has its own interpretation of it an episode just on the role itself would be really helpful. <laughs> I guess for the the first question, it would be, you know, what really defines, you know, a royal mistress versus just a mistress? Mm. Yeah, so a royal mistress, you know, when we, when we kind of use this term, we mean that it is, you know, an official position, right? So um, there are plenty of people who have a mistress as in just a side piece, you know, but by the time they enter the record and we're using the term royal, what we mean by that is that these are women who are exercising some power at court um, in addition to, you know, also having a relationship with the king, right? Um, And they really can exercise rather a lot of power because, well, they've got the king's ear, right? So, and this is can be difficult for people to wrap their heads around because I think that there is this real modern preconception of the way that marriage works that like it must be monogamous and it's like... "Eh." Not really, <laughs> you know, like, like or not, not really for these guys, you know, um, and it would be one thing if you were a queen and you've got, but, but even then queens certainly do have royal, uh, what, what is the term we use for them? Well, not concubines. Anyway, my point is like, yeah, yeah, right. So, you know, and, and this is, the, you know, there are a lot of um, parallels to this all around the world. So, you know, in, in the, uh, in Asian courts, you often see concubines, things like this, but the the point of a Royal mistress is that one is more than simply, you know, in a relationship, one also can wield power. And that's why these women are so interesting, I think. For sure. And do you think that it is one of those aspects that's expected that a Royal mistress will have this kind of political power Because you do think Mm. of women like Madame de Pompadour and even Anne Boleyn, although people argue whether she was or wasn't, they do have these very powerful political roles. Do you think that is sort of built into the title? Yeah, I do think so, because I think that if you aren't exercising power, we it, it's interesting because it's almost, um, sometimes it is, it is a, a title that they will actually have. You know, so, certainly a Madame de Pompadour does, um, mm-hmm. but um, at other times it's one that we kind of assign to them. So, you know, by the time that they're showing up in the record and they're exercising power, then we're like, oh, okay, here we go. Everybody, we've got a, we've got a royal mistress on our hands, you know? Um, and so, especially if we're kind of like talking about um, medieval uh, consorts and things like that. Um, but uh, it, it does kind of determine whether or not you're, you're going to have power. And this is why, you know, people are also quite uh, antsy about them a lot of the time it's because you know it would be it would be all well and good if you were just you know the queen's mistress and you're just kind of having a rollicking good time and no one cares about that you know the but there is always this kind of um 
well, actually, I was I was about to say unspoken thing, but no, it's spoken. It's genuinely spoken. You know, this this worry that uh, by the time that you're having um, a a sexual relationship with a with a king, you can sway them, right? Um, and and that's the worry there. And and you know, obviously, like that's what the queen's supposed to be doing. Uh, but you know, quite frankly, very often, uh, queens and kings aren't in love. You know, that's not that's not their job. That's not what the position is about. Um. And, you know, because of the way that misogyny works and everything, you know, it's it's more difficult. Like, like you can you can have, uh, I suppose, um, a royal master, I guess, is the, you know, masculine equivalent if you are a queen. But your but your husband needs to be dead or or like off the scene, you know, at the very least, you need to have uh, got to a point in your relationship that's so acrimonious that he is in another country constantly. And then you can kind of think about I'm thinking about, for example, Queen Isabel, the she wolf, very famously has uh has a master um and and everyone is very shady about that whole thing you know it, it's, it's completely different when you're when you're a woman there's a lot more um emphasis placed on that but uh, for kings it's sort of like eh, help yourself provided you think that you can balance these demands and you know it's not uncommon for um men to kind of have mistresses royal mistresses in who are coming from the upper echelons of nobility so they'll be you know there's there are power plays involved in this as well right so but there's a little bit more freedom on the part of kings to pick partners that they would like as mistresses which is which is why everyone is so concerned about this because it's like oh no he likes that woman <laughs> you know he's gonna want to keep her on side you know whereas with queens it's like i'm doing this because it's politically expedient and i don't want to make my wife angry but you know it's, it's not like oh darling i would do anything to to keep you happy kind of deal right yeah what would you say sort of throughout history the difference is between the royal mistress and the queen because it does seem that they often get a role that is often barred from the queen of that country. Yeah. So one of the things that is going to happen with mistresses is they, there are kind of, you know, court based rules about when and where they can be right. Cause the queen can kind of do whatever the hell she wants. Like really, really, you know, they, they wield enormous amounts of power. Um, even if, even if it is soft power, you know, now we tend to kind of denigrate the role of queenship because we're sort of like, oh, well, the, you know, she wasn't on a horse 24 seven with a sword. So that means that she doesn't have any, power. no, absolutely not. You know, Queens, um, well, in the first place, sometimes Queens are on a horse with a sword. So <laughs> there's, there's that, uh, but you know, um, they, they command a lot of respect and you, you cannot trifle with them. Right. So if it's all well and good for you to have a Royal mistress, if you're a King, but you need to keep her the hell out of the Queen's sight. I'll tell you that much. Like she cannot be like promenading about at court, you know, and if the queen is mad about it, you, you, you will know. Right. So oftentimes royal mistresses um, are kept in, you know, other castles kind of like away from where the generalized court is. If, if the queen is also in residence. So basically you're not going to have them around. Um, and it is like one of these things that is, sometimes you have these kind of really tragic stories where, ugh, this is about a real historian brain hours. I'm like, one of the kings of France, you know, like, all, like uh, I don't know. They all look alike to me. They're all named Louis. I don't know. It's, it was probably one of the Louis, right? He had, um, he had a mistress for something like 17 years. And on his deathbed was like, please, I, I want to see my mistress. And his wife was like, ha, no. And just like completely bars his mistress from like coming to say goodbyes. And so it can it can get to these places that are really acrimonious and, and difficult. And obviously too, they're like, well, I think that's a really heartless move. You know, you've got a lot of kind of um, uh, a way like Christian ways of backing that up. Right. Because still technically, like technically you're doing the wrong thing. Uh, but I think it's quite interesting and it, it really kind of shows you rather a lot about how early modern and medieval society works because it's like, yeah, there's the rules, but nobody's following them. Right. And you know, the the rules are just kind of technicalities that kind of get brought up later in order to justify things like this when Queens and mistresses are in conflict, but they're not enough to stop a mistress from existing. For example, do you think that that could be part of the negative perception that comes out about certain mistresses? Like you do have Diane de Poitiers or even Anne Boleyn or Madame de Montespan who are very Mm. open about this role that they're playing. And they're sort of the ones who have become notorious in a negative way. Mm, Yeah, no, I I, I think that's quite prescient because I think uh, the thing is one of one of the issues 
with royal mistresses is you're playing into all the kind of like preconceived notions about what women are. Right. So and, and you're kind of doing it. You're like, yeah, you know, the, I'm that girl. Right? You know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one that everybody warned you about. And, you know, there, there is this idea that women are, you know, these overtly sexual beings who are rather conniving. There's a specific kind of conception of women as being scheming um, and emotionally manipulative and able to kind of um, move men around based on emotions, um, but specifically for ill. And the thing is that once you've got to those levels and you kind of like you get to the highest echelons, you know, you're being you're being upfront about it. You're like, yeah, well, that's that's how I got here. What <laughs> What is it that you want me to do? And that obviously uh, sets a lot of people's teeth on edge uh, because, you know, you're doing the thing that everyone accuses women of, of doing, right? And it's kind of like, uh, there's no plausible de deniability about it. Um, and, and, and indeed, this is something that we still see women accused of today. So uh, to be fair. But I think that there's also within this, there's this kind of idea of uh, often you will see royal mistresses are accused of kind of like being overly profligate or luxurious. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, so it's not just that they are like overtly sexual and scheming, uh, but they're also kind of like is almost always seen as sort of creaming off money that ought to be going elsewhere. You know, often, often um, their taste in fashion is critiqued. Um, you know, their love of parties is critiqued, and and they and usually you do see this particularized role for mistresses where they're they're kind of party girls, right? Uh, they they're the fun one. So, you know, like, whereas the queen is kind of like laid up all the time, like with a million kids and, and, and a really important job, they're all like, honey, do you want to get drunk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and uh, which kings love, they love that, you know? So um, there, there is also this kind of, um, it, and it, it, it's the same sort of massages that they do now. It's like the women be shopping thing, right? But for royal mistresses. So, so it's like, oh, and you're spending all this money. And what is this for? And really oughtn't royal life to be uh, more pious? And shouldn't you be calming all these things down? Um, in a way that queens, don't, they don't face quite that level of critique. Certainly some of it is there, obviously. Um, you know, uh, so like see Marie Antoinette for more information. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's just kind of like once, when one is a mistress, it's always dialed up all the way to 11. You know. Yeah. Even with Marie Antoinette, I've heard the argument that part of the negativity towards her was that her husband didn't have a mistress. Mm -hmm. So she sort of took on that negative role for him. Yeah. And it, that's a quite interesting thing, especially in the modern French court of like the expectation of the mistress. Right. Um, yeah. And so uh, and, and, and I think that this is really um, it's an important kind of thing to think about because uh, in our modern sensibilities and the way that we tend to think about a, you know, marriage as this, as a romantic institution, as opposed to a business institution, um, you know, they're just not thinking like that. So when you do have love matches, it's sort of like, oh, well, that's perverse. <laughs> you know, like, well, what, you love your wife? That's disgusting. You know, like, and I, th this goes back to kind of courtly love literature. And you'll see this, for example, in um, Andreas Kapilanis' De Amore in like the, the courts of love things, which Eleanor Bogotain is theoretically presiding over. I mean, she, pr she probably wasn't, but you know, whatever. It's, it's a nice little thought exercise. Um, you know, that there's this, this explicit thing that one cannot be in love with one's husband or wife and that the institution of marriage is, is kind of antithetical to any form of love. So even if you do marry someone that you're in love with, then that marriage then annuls the love and then you're going to need to take on a side piece <laughs> because if, if what you want is romance right because you can't um, have a romantic situation and uh, and a business situation at the same time um, and so that's what these kind of worries are come into play with her and um you know occasionally you see people like it uh you know i suppose um here in england the the eleanor of castile that's the really celebrated one where you know the the king and queen were very in love and everyone was like oh that's really cute but then she dies tragically and you know there there are all there are all these things right uh but uh you know as opposed to eleanor of aquitaine who hated her, her both her husbands you know <laughs> like yeah. god bless her uh, got really, really dealt a rough hand there um, in the husband stakes. Um, and so, you, you know, there's always this kind of um, edge, but certainly r relationships that we see that are romantic between kings and queens are so, they're rare as hen's teeth. You know, I could be like, oh, yeah, well, there's one. You, you like, you can pick them out, you know. So, yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, Louis and Marie Antoinette, Eleanor and Henry. Uh, you, know, you know, like, it's just kind of like, 
you, you can kind of name all five, right? Exactly. Yeah, that book is a very short book mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. royal love stories. Of God. You know, we do, I feel like for a lot of people, when they think of the royal mistress, they immediately go to France mm-hmm. in their mind. And would you say that France is the one that created that role that we think of today? Or has it been a role really throughout history? So, you know, I think that the thing is with France is that they are just kind of one of the most important places, right, in in medieval and early modern Europe. Like, I mean, and even into modern Europe, right? Mm -hmm. They they are sort of like the gold standard which dictates what royalty is, like what is kingship? What does royalty look like? Um, And of course, you know, um, I would say kind of on par with them are like the Holy Roman Emperors, but that's a really different kind of of power. So it doesn't, because, you know, it's elected and there are all these like, there are all these moving parts, right? You don't have that same, no one kind of looks to the imperial court for these same things because other people aren't emperors, right? Other people are kings. Other people are like, uh, you know, the, the I don't know, you're the the Duke of Burgundy or something, you know, like the, it's nobility who are more specifically en- emulating royalty. So the kings of France are the ones who kind of set the standard for what it means to be a fancy lad. Right. And so, and so uh, like when they're like, oh yeah, I've got this mistress. Everyone is like, oh, the mistresses yeah you, you know so we, we we just kind of look to them because they're trendsetters mm. you know um and you know this is a, a very kind of real cultural cachet that france has in in these periods where they are they're very much um the ones who lead the way who kind of establish um like how incredibly fancy one can be and what that means and and, and these these sorts of things so um I think that, you, I mean, you definitely see mistresses pop up everywhere around Europe. Like it, it, there, you can't come up with a single court that didn't have a mistress at a point in time who wielded some power. It's just that the French, uh, when they do it, everyone says, oh, isn't that so chic? <laughs> so it's kind of like that. Yeah. 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 Oh, isn't that so French? <laughs> like, I thought, oh, wow. Like, ooh, fa- oh, a mistress. Oh. <laughs> An official title that you get in court. Oh. Like, oh. I bet, I bet she's wearing real nice dresses, you know, like that, that's kind of it, right? So, mm. and also, would you say like our perception of that royal mistress is very European based? Because you did mention at the very beginning, like concubines in Asian courts, but like, is that, would you say that's sort of a different role from the royal mistress? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I suppose so because it is more official, right? Like that is a marriage. Right. And, and there, there is that differentiation there. Um, so, you know, concubines are certainly married. And then they're, within that, too, there, it kind of establishes a ranking system or pecking order, uh, you know, where as a general rule of thumb, you know, the first wife, she's the one who's got the most power. But the thing is that often emperors or kings within this, con- this uh, construct will then like have a favorite. Mm. concubine and then that's kind of you know that's where the 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 power comes in but um it's more established um and it's it's more official i suppose it's like a mistress plus right uh kind of a deal um but and you certainly see this also um is sometimes at the islamic courts and stuff where you have multiple wives and that kind of thing so it, it will become the first one is always the fanciest the first one always wields the most power herself but there is a possibility of the later wives becoming the favorite, essentially. And then that also plays into like, who has a son, who doesn't have a son. Oh, good Lord, yeah. You know, which is, which is sort of the thing about Anne Boleyn, right? And which is a, a quite interesting one because, um, you know, whether or not they were getting down before they got married, which, you know, feasible, in- incredibly feasible. You know, there, there there is this sort of looking at her being like, oh, well, she's French. She's like, well, she's not French. <laughs> so, yeah. like, calm, so calm down. Like, you know, but, you know, all English people are sort of like, uh, well, all English people, all uh, English royalty and nobility, you know, are essentially French to a certain extent at, at this point, you know, because yeah. they, they only got over here a couple hundred years before, you know, the Henry was in power or whatever. Um, and then, you know, there isn't a son. So here's Anne. And it's like, it, it combines all these things like this, this Frenchness, this sexiness, uh, this possibility for fecundity, who's going to deliver, you know, the desired son. And, and that's certainly at play also in the Eastern courts. Even you know? in that era of the English court, like you do see records of them looking at the French court and saying, oh, we're not that. Like we're, we're better than that. 
And so even mm-hmm. within England, was that a very different role expectation? The, so the, the trouble with the English, <laughs> she says, <laughs> she says living in London, you know, the, 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 the trouble with the, the, the English is that um, they are both attracted to and repulsed by the French at all times, you know, where uh, they very much see themselves as in competition with the French and the French are like, ha, oh, that's cute. <laughs> you know, like that's the, this is sort of the thing that the English are like oh we've got this great rivalry and the French are like do we <laughs> okay you know because it, it seems like we sent a couple of our guys over there and they took it over a few hundred all right okay See, fair enough um so there there is this kind of um desire to look down on, on the french or frenchness as being like you know antithetical to englishness but also you got to understand like when we're talking about the tudor court these people have only started speaking english at court like five minutes ago you know it, it was all french all the time before this you know the, the idea that one would ever like speak english or that there was like some kind of a, like idea of englishness um in in that way is kind of like very uh, it's it's kind of modern, isn't it? So there's this conscious decision to kind of be, try to make it, an Englishness happen at this point in time that is, you know, and this is after, you know, the whole Hundred Years' War has kind of fallen apart. Uh, you know, when, when they're like, you know, the ultimate play on the part of English people to prove that they're French. Or, and then that didn't work. And they're like, well, we didn't want to be French. Ah, how about that? You know, and you're like, okay, sure, sure. Um, so yeah, they, they're a really complex one, you know. Um, but, you know, at the Spanish courts and things, you'll often see the, the same sorts of uh, dealings. Although sometimes you also see backlash against it because they'll be like, what are we, Muslim? You know, because, uh, you know, they, yeah, they, they've got, you know, a particularized uh, beef going with the Moriscos. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you, you'll see all the time. We know for a fact, you know, as uh, talking about um, courts of love under Eleanor of Aquitaine, did they happen? We don't know. Well, by the 14th century, Spanish courts were doing that. Mm. So, and they, and they were like, no, we, we, oh, we will have mistresses. That'll be fun. But, you know, it's very important to be doing it in the kind of like courtly love realm of things so that you're, so you're not underlined like Muslims. Right. So there, there's a, there's a, a nice heap of kind of xenophobia going on there for that. Yeah. Is there is through pretty much all of European history. Oh God, yeah. Oh God, it is. And you, you never know. You never know on the Iberian Peninsula whether they're really going to like the, be getting on or they're going to be at each other's throats. It's you know the whole like convivencia thing certainly exists at certain times and at others not so much, right? And it just kind of depends on land and who's got enough power and things of this nature. Right? Exactly. And then you know we have the the Russian court where you have a lot of women who are in that power who are taking favorites like Potemkin and those men who do wield Mm. power. But I would say that probably on the European stage, they're the ones who are like, Oh, Catherine, the great's a whore. Yeah. It's, it's really funny that way. So, you know, you do have this like specific, like Russian ability to like go for it. It's like, Oh, it seems like you're powerful. Have fun girls, you know, and Europeans are like, my God, you know, pearl clutching. (laughs) Well, this woman is behaving like a man, you know, kind of a, a Dale, you know, or, or even, you know, with Queen Isabella, as I, I was mentioning before, it was like, my, the she-wolf. So, oh, oh, how dare she? You know, it's like, oh, come on, come on. Right. You yeah. know, it's kind yeah. of, kind of a, a thing. So there's always, you know, room for, for women to have, you know, like courtly romances, things off to the side, provided they keep them down. Right. I mean, we even see this um, up until like uh, the, Zar- the last Tsarina, right? And this whole, you know, all the hand wringing about uh, Rasputin, right? About like, oh, uh, is, is she having sex with him? Like, oh, well, any- anyone who has like a favorite like this, it must be uh, sexual in nature. So it-, it is quite interesting within a Russian context because women have more freedom, but Europeans, like Western Europeans, lose their minds over this. They're like, they, they really, they really don't like it at all whatsoever. Um, and there, there, I mean, I, I suppose that within the within the context of Tsarinas, kind of the thing that's going on is that like power is power, right? And and you have the ability to delineate what it is you're going to do with it if you are at that level, and no one can really tell you what to do. Um, which cool. You know, in my opinion, I'm like, I'm like, all right, ladies, I love to see it. You know, great, good, nice. Right? And, you know, do you, I mean, obviously patriarchy has been a thing from the dawn of time, but do you think that that mm. is where you sort of see this divide that, yeah, Catherine the Great gets 
all of these horrible rumors and then yeah louis the 14th isn't called a whore <laughs> like yeah the louis the 14th everyone like literally it's like oh how chic like that's <laughs> that, that that's it you know that's it and never and it, it's very much celebrated yeah right Every, everyone loves that about louis the 14th it's kind of like oh you never know whose wife he's gonna shag isn't that great you know and so and i mean it, it is just kind of like one of these patriarchal things where you know it's incredibly ironic in these contexts where you know women are seen as the ones who are overly sexual and scheming and you know maniacal and, and all these things and it's like yeah well i don't know these guys seem pretty slutty with it yeah <laughs> i say slutty as a reclaimed word i'm just gonna <laughs> just want to point that out but um you, you know it definitely does shake down like that where the, the minute a woman pops up with like her guy it's like oh this is completely unacceptable but men can just sort of help themselves and yeah certainly um there is a level in there that is linked to kind of worries about um, women giving birth. But, you know, like men have bastards all over the place. So like, why is that fine? Right. You know, and like, what, like, why would it necessarily challenge the order any more than, than men's bastards is, is sort of the question mark. And, um, you know, and it, it just, it does just come down to misogyny. That's just, that is just the way it works. There's, there's nothing you can say or do. You know? Exactly. And, you know, for so many of these women, it is the sexual side that really gives you the title of royal mistress. But you do see some instances like Madame de Pompadour, who eventually says mm -hmm. no more of that, <laughs> but she stays mm -hmm. politically active. Would you say that yeah. that is more rare or that that could be a role for a royal mistress as well. You know, you do kind of very occasionally see things like this, you know, like someone will get, you, especially as you're getting on in life. You know, mm -hmm. when people sort of want to get right with God, it becomes like one of these things. And, and you do you do see it now. Having said that, you know, Madame de Pompadour is, uh, you know, she's a tour de force. There's a reason why she's one of the ones that we bring up all the time, because she just uh, absolutely killed it in this role. You know, and, and a lot of the time, you know, what, these are these are men who are in love. Uh, that that's usually what the kind of role of, of a mistress is. And, you know, men who are in love, like anyone in love, oftentimes hopes that they're going to shag the person that they're in love with. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not common, I would say. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I'm sure that it's in there. And I kind of think that a lot of the hope that uh, that people have, like, within these contexts, because these, these are pretty overtly Christian, they do know that they're doing something wrong. And the, I think the kind of hope there is that they're going to get the good death, right? They're going to know that they're dying, and they'll be able to call the priest and do the whole, bless me, Father, I have sinned thing. And then that will get them out of jail free, you know, uh, it, it, yeah, in purgatory or whatever. So there, there is some worry about this, but Madame de Pompadour is able to play that really cleverly and say, oh no, let's, let, like, let's get Catholic with it now. <laughs> and it's, a, oh, that's, you know, a, a very interesting way of doing things, you know. I mean, it is, I'm reading a book right now that's sort of in that era of Madame de Pompadour and it is like, oh my God, you just said no, but you stayed mm -hmm. so powerful. It's, Absolutely. You know, like very, very few women would be able to pull off that particular gambit. I can tell you that. Much. Yeah. Yeah. Hats off to her. I know. Just absolutely love it. You know, Lo love her for that yeah, one. Power play. Really interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the misconception or n not a misconception of the mistresses who are sort of throwing money everywhere. They're the party girls. But would you say that there are other sort of common misconceptions that people have when they think of the role of the royal mistress? Um, yeah, I think that sometimes people do also think that this is kind of like a role which is necessarily one that is ostracized. So, you know, they read conflict between queens and mistresses as to say, oh, and then like this woman is a pariah. Right. And that's not the case. Um, you know, they essentially can kind of like conglomerate their own set of ladies in waiting. Um, you know, they can make their own deals at court. They and, and people will kind of use them strategically in order to get their own uh, political goals met. So, you know, if you are, you know, in, within the nobility and you know that it might be a little bit easier for you to get in with the mistress than the queen, well, then that's the door that you're going to push. Right. So it's. It is important to remember that there is there is a hierarchy that is in place, certainly, about who wields power. But that does not mean that, um, you know, these women need to, like, hide their faces in shame when they're out and about in the street. And, you know, you see more pushback in writing 
to them than they would have ever experienced to their faces. Like, you know, it, it's the equivalent of kind of like trolling on the internet, right? Like people will write things about these women that they would never say uh, to their faces. So that's, that's one thing to kind of keep in mind, you know? That's no, that's a good point for sure that they did not seem to be overly ostracized in the court. Also probably yeah. because of how close they were to the King no one's going to cross that line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, you're really having to say, like, oh, you're going to get in a fight with the king about it. You're going to tell the king he's wrong. Like, good luck. Yeah. Like, let me, know, let me know how that works out. Exactly. You know, like, and let, let's just see your, because that's the thing, is that your station at court will drop if you do that. So you have to balance things really finely. And certainly you can declare for the queen, but it's just going to mean that you're in a particularized kind of, like, um, power orbit. Yeah. Right? Definitely. And... Why would you say that this sort of negative perception has persisted down the generations? Like, I don't even know if today they're necessarily celebrated by popular mm. perception. They still have this sort of negative aura around them. Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that's kind of really shifted for us, too, is our, our definition of marriage. Right. So we now that we see marriage as a romantic institution, we're like, oh, homewreckers, you know. So it, it's interesting because um, we've kind of lost the sort of uh, religious sensibility of it. Whereas I think that a lot of objections that you see earlier on are expressly um, about, you know, r religious issues. Right. Um, and uh, I think now what we have changed is that, um, you know, our impression of what marriage is um, our real desire to see um, a monogamy as like a natural state, mm. uh, quote, which we fight really hard on. And it's like, oh, God bless yeah. us. Um, <laughs> you, you know, uh, and so as a result of this, you kind of um, read these women as, you know, social climbing grifter home records. Right. And um, that's just not the case, because that's not what a home is. That's not what marriage is. That's not what any of these things are. And, you know, there is, of course, like just a healthy dose of slut shaming in there as well, where it's like, well, you shouldn't be doing this because, you know, it's it's naughty. And, and we and we definitely have that. You know, we, we have this um, we have the same uh, disgust with women who gain power through sexual means that they did. Um and and we're we're pretty we're pretty clear about that right and so yeah do you think that that is part of what sort of bothers popular society about this role is like how blatantly sexual they are yeah because i think that there's you cannot get around it right and i think it troubles us right because um, the, a lot of the ways that we want to think about history is that we want to think that like sex got in, invented in the 1960s Right. Like this, yeah. is, this is really, you know, central to the way that we like to think about the history of sexuality is that um, everyone was definitely doing what the church wanted them to do the whole time. <laughs> and like no one ever did anything naughty and they were all very religious. And, you know, this is like no and nobody ever had sex except to, to procreate. And what mistresses do is they show, you no, know, here's this whole world that is kind of centered on you know, uh, like sexual pleasure, luxuriousness, all of these things that we uh, want to think we invented. So if you look at them, <laughs> then it's kind of like, oh, what do I, what do, I do with this? And, and also, it, it's difficult for us to, when we see that they aren't necessarily ostracized, you know, when we're kind of like, oh, are you allowed to do that? Yeah, they're allowed to do that, right? Like, that's, that's the whole point. And, but we, we want to be the ones who are sexy. Right. We want to be the ones who invented things like that. So it, it makes yeah. us uncomfortable. And would you say that for the role of the royal mistress, would you say that the sexual side bothers us more or that political maneuvering that you see the woman claiming? I don't know how you disentangle the two. Uh, basically, it is, is my thing, it, because I, I think that what bothers us about it is that they've got to power through sex essentially you know they, their their entire role and the power that they do wield hinges on the fact that they're in sexual contact with the king and we don't like that <laughs> definitely yeah, yeah and then you do see sometimes in history some of these royal mistresses making it to that ultimate level of actually becoming queen as well that you do see the the Anne Boleyn but even Peter the Great's mistress, who becomes Catherine the <laughs> First. Like, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, you know, one for all of the side chicks out there. Like, hold on to the dream. You know, yeah. if if the if she dies, then you know, you know, you might get in there. And I think that also bothers us, <laughs> right? Is is this kind of like, 
oh, oh, and then they did get married. You know, we don't like that either. We want there to be some kind of like a moral comeuppance <laughs> for, for these women. You know, we want them to kind of like um, die estranged and, and kicked out of court after the king dies. And so when they actually get married, everyone is sort of like, oh, heavens to Betsy, you know, kind of kind of deal. You know, we, we, we desire for... Um, women this you know and, and I guess one of our also um were one of the ways that we want to kind of like approach women and sexuality in these things is saying oh that there's kind of like a, a timer on it and that like oh well when you're not young any longer then he's not going to want to be with you anymore because if this is all sexual then it, you know so it also troubles that mm-hmm. right you know the idea that like you can have an ongoing sexual relationship with someone that you're you that you're in love with you know into into old age that troubles us as well you know, uh, yeah, like, oh, no, 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 you're supposed to be done at that point. It's like, oh, no. Mm. So, it, you know, and these are these are kind of the stories that we tell uh, specifically about women who kind of use, uh, you know, if kind of sex is their job. You know, we say this about sex workers all the time. We're desperate to say that, oh, there's a timer on on how long sex workers can work. Right. And, uh, you know, to a certain extent, royal mistresses are just like incredibly high level sex workers. Right. Yeah. So and so we we want there to be. Um, a cutoff point. So when you're Catherine the first, everyone's like, oh, <laughs> you know, kind of like you know, tugging at their collars and, and worried about uh, what, what this means. Because um, we want to be able to kind of um, cast sexuality as unimportant um, and also uh, time limited, I suppose. It's interesting that you do mention the sex, sex workers as well, because I do think that that is regularly a slur thrown at royal mistresses oh god yeah oh lord all the time you know um and uh it's a it's a really interesting one right because uh it's you know and we've got to understand like all throughout like these periods that we're talking to like the sex worker that's a job man like and everyone agrees that it's a is it everybody's favorite job no but i'm you know a lot of the time it isn't legal uh, and, you know, it's, it, this is kind of like something that is a, a, a necessary part of society. And, you know, you also have um, sex workers who can reach really high echelons of society. So, you know, like famously in Venice, the courtesans mm. there, like, you know, rule that town. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, uh, yeah, like they, they've got a lot going for them. So you can kind of throw this around at mistresses um, because you can kind of like bring out, you know, you know and, and, and as I say, it is it is fairly similar, you know. Uh, but, well, joke's on you because I don't see you. Like, you're, you're not the one who can get the king to do what he wants. But it's kind of necessary for people to use those slurs and use those insults uh, because they kind of think that reminding everyone of the sexual nature of this relationship is going to prove that these women are bad. And I'm kind of like, well, like, you know, that that just depends on your interpretation, right? Like, I'll be like, why are you so mad about sex? I guess is right. the thing. And, and, you know, and you know why they're so mad about sex. But it, it's, um, you know, if that, uh, that if it can't hurt you, it can't hurt you, you know? And I think that, that that's kind of true for a lot of these women. They're like, and, <laughs> you know, what? Or like, except for, except for Madame de Pompadour, right? Who's kind of like, no, I don't even do that anymore, so what you got right you know which is such a fun one right it's such a power move every time for Mm -hmm. her and even within that like there are a a level of hierarchy of you look at like madame de pompadour but then you look at madame du barry and even Mm. catherine the first and in its way like people want to say that anne boleyn came from nothing but there is like this but like (laughs) yeah it's a a commoner (laughs) it's like like, like, my god like i mean the the boleyns are incredibly rich and important there is a reason she was at court in france she was getting fancied up you know like everybody knew that they were fancy these are fancy people right exactly and and it's like levels of wealth that you and i could only dream of and like what you mean is that she wasn't royal already which i suppose is kind of like sure um because certainly you know uh henry's married to in infanta of spain you know when all when all this starts popping off um but then you know he goes on to marry several noble women afterwards you know like like after you know after he decides that he's protestant so he can get laid you know mm-hmm. um so it's like uh, it, that suddenly it's like yeah just kind of help yourself and there's a grab bag like reach in there and take what what it is you want so we do put a lot of emphasis on um Anne Boleyn for that one and it is quite interesting because i think sometimes she kind of gets the blame 
I suppose, for the English Reformation. <laughs> yeah. And it's sort of like, it, well, it's not really her fault, is it? It's kind of like Henry's fault for having no chill. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, like this, I think that the, the kind of desire to present her as a commoner, as opposed to every other woman who kind of married, I mean, I suppose Anne of Cleves, notwithstanding. But I mean, still similarly, you know, she's not, she's not exactly royal. So, you, yeah. you know, it's... Um, you, you know, like, uh, because no one is going to, no one is shipping princesses up there after, after you kill one or two, uh-uh. it's, it's kind of like that, that is it. Like, <laughs> so, like, no, I'm like, you're, you're definitely not getting any princesses after that. So, uh, but I think that we emphasize that to just kind of be like, oh, and then she just kind of like clawed her way up with her genitals. And it's like, ugh, you know, like she was, she was very much a, a staple at court which is how she got into this position to begin with. So let everybody calm down, you know? Yeah. And do you think that that is also our need of saying, you know, a certain kind of woman would never do this. They would never condescend to this role. So it takes someone like Anne Boleyn or Madame de Berry or whoever, who is like coming from nowhere. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that that's certainly like at play because, um, you know, no one would ever do this if they were actually royal. Let's be honest, you know, like, like you, you will get in so much goddamn trouble if you try to pull this off and and you are a princess or something like that is that is just not on the table. Like these, these are not decisions that you can make. So one of the things that's kind of going on here is that there is a freedom that these women have that other women who are higher up the chain don't have. Hmm. Because they can't, they can't decide to be a royal mistress because it would destroy their family. Right. Um, So that kind of then gets sorted into there's a right kind of woman and a wrong kind of woman. And, you know, there is, and certainly there's a social climbing aspect to it. Right. So, um, you know, there's, there's this way of kind of uh, seeing nobility and a way that medieval people talk about nobility as kind of like, um, it's, it's very funny. They're kind of like, Oh, it's, it's genetic. Right. They're like, Oh, we, we all, we are, we all come from Adam and Eve, but the reason why the nobility exists is that they have been set apart from the rest of humanity because of their excellent courtesy and excellent manners. Right. Right. So the people who are kind of like being really upfront and saying, Oh, here it is. Like I'm, I'm a mistress. It's sort of like, well, you're violating this idea of what it means to be noble and why it is that we are allowed to kind of like live the high life off of the labor of, you know, 85% of the European <laughs> population who are out in the field right now, you know, and um, it, so it, it kind of calls into question the very reason why nobility exists in the first place. So they need to really also compound and say, oh, well, these people are common. These people are common. They're not actually nobility because um, otherwise it calls this really, you know, unethical system <laughs> into, into uh question, right? Exactly. And do you think that links up with the same thing of saying about some of these women that they came from sex work originally? Like that is what mm. they were to come. Yeah. I, I mean, and absolutely, you know, and, and, and at times, you know, I think that sometimes it is just sex workers and you're like, well done girl. Like, glad. you know, this happened. I guess Luke, I want to say Louis the Fifteenth's mistress. I think she was just a straight up sex worker. I, so. I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong on that. But anyway, and, I, and I'm always like, "Good job, girl." You know, and but you know, so this this kind of shows you kind of the difference between Madame de Pompadour and her, mm-hmm. because like she gets kicked out of court the minute Louis the Fifteenth gets ill. They're like, "Get go, go, go!" You know, like get out, get out, get out, and she gets chased off. Could never do that with Madame de Pompadour, right? And that that shows that you can go ahead and call Madame de Pompadour anything you want. Right. Mm-hmm. But she's going nowhere and there's nothing that you can do with that. So there are still also these levels, but also, you know, this is, this is the troubling thing. When you have sex workers who get to this level too, it kind of then makes the noble ones be like, Oh God, Duh. <laughs> you know, like they, cause they, they want to, they want to say, no, that's not what's going on. So it kind of, it's a, this really kind of delicate power balance but as a general rule of thumb you can kind of see how it comes out in the wash when the men are dying or dead that's kind of like when these things really really come into play the role of their like where they are in court Mm -hmm. really comes out to play and i would say for a misconception that i've seen many times in like hollywood and films and television series is that these women were like vulgar and they Mm. were very they dressed inappropriately, they chewed with their mouth open, they cussed all over the place. Mm. Would that have been common in these spaces or is that a sort of stereotype? 
I think to a certain extent that's a stereotype. Um, and, you know, the, the thing is, when we say that these women are vulgar, what we mean is that it's like, you know, their sexuality is on display. Right. And then we then extrapolate that and say, and then they're also they've got bad table manners and they do this and they do that and everything else on, on down the line. Um, I would be very surprised if, you know, you were to get in the time machine and go check out these girls at the dinner table, if that's what's going on. Right. You know, because I think that uh, these are women who are incredibly smart, very ambitious and know how to play their cards really well. So I just don't think that they are out there to like embarrass the king at table. You know, by the time you got to this point, you were playing all your cards right. Um, and, you know, it it should be, I mean, sure, there's probably, there, there there may be, you know, a case or two here and there, but I mean, like, come on, Anne Boleyn doesn't have good table manners. Get out, yeah, get, <laughs> get out of here with that. Like, I was like, I'm not, Catherine the first, Catherine the first doesn't have good table. That's what you're telling yeah. me. Like, oh, come on. Yeah. And, you know, sure, maybe they uh, dress differently or like particularized things, but I think the vulgarity there is oftentimes they kind of respond to the desires of the king. Mm-hmm. Right. And so and so, you know, it's kind of like the, this dressing for men versus dressing for women thing where we, we still have this kind of conversation now when a woman is perceived as being um, too sexy in her dressing. We'll say, oh, well, she dresses for men. She dresses for mm-hmm. men. You know, like and, and, and classy girls dress for other women. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is like you hear this. Right. And so and I think it's that it's that thing that's kind of at play. Right? Yeah. How much of these terms came down and are still used <laughs> today mm-hmm. just in a different Every context. Time you don't Mm -hmm. see I mean would you say that you see that role anymore today I would say I can't really think of one that's so blatantly a role as it used to be Mm. I mean I suppose that like uh, everybody knew about Camilla Uh, and uh, you know it it was certainly like noted that (laughs) if you wanted like Prince Charles's ear you could ear you could go to her um and you know people were none too happy about it uh yeah. <laughs> you know as well but that but part of that is just because diana was so kind of mm-hmm. well she was universally beloved by individuals the press hated her uh which is kind of how you get here so that that's certainly there um and it's an interesting one too because like you know you'll see it at play for example when people talk about uh for example meliana trump mm-hmm. who we like don't, don't get me wrong not a fan. Uh, I think her politics are horrible and I don't, you know, and I don't like her, but one of the things that I see all the time and like, I often kind of like take uh, my fellow individuals on the left to task for is you see people like start slut shaming hard, like whenever she comes up and I'm like, there is no need to do this. Like, you know, we don't have to, I was like, Oh, what? So she took topless photos. So she's a bad person. No, she's a bad person because her politics are crap, right? Like she's a bad person because she's a part of the reactionary, right? Not because like she used to be a glamor model, right? Like, and so we still do this, you know, and even people who think that they're being well-meaning or that they are like, they're, they're proving some kind of point. It's like, Oh yeah, well, well she she's a slut like okay well congratulations yeah. right like get 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 a better criticism is what i have to say about that you know um and so you do kind of you do kind of see things there but it's less with um kind of like a mistress role and now we're kind of like yeah what what we do it with is like someone's third wife right? <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. and it is it is interesting to see sort of what you were even saying, this post era of seeing marriage in a very different way as well, that, mm. you know, the Camilla was never respected in that sense for that role. It was like, oh, she's a homewrecker. And mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. Melania is a social climber and look at what she's achieved. And she got him away from one of his wives, like also homewrecker. Yeah. Like, and it, yeah, right. So we, we we really still kind of like cling on to these kind of ideals. And it, it's quite interesting. So, for example, in the kind of like Charles and Camilla question, because, you know, like, I think that Charles really perceived himself as to be like, getting married in like the traditional way that kings did where it's like okay well this yeah. is probably the smartest thing and diana god bless her <laughs> really thought that she was she was getting married for love you know um and like through no fault of her own i don't you know like mm-hmm. you know she was just quite innocent you know like jesus christ she was a child right it's uh yeah. you know not a literal child <laughs> so <laughs> i'm not i'm not accusing uh the the, the king of anything uh but uh, you know she was she was so incredibly young and she was very naive and like here you are suddenly on all the tvs and here's your big fancy wedding and you know um it, it kind of just shows you how uh you know um, in in my opinion the entire office of royalty is really bad for everybody kind of concerned you know especially this like 
why we have a king, I, do, I cannot tell you at this moment. And, um, you know, it's the reason why he wasn't able to marry Camilla in the first place, which was like, there was all these rules about like, you know, Diana had a literal virginity test done to her, you know? Wild to and, me. And it's like, you, what, what are you talking about? You know, so it's if there had been any freedom of choice that Charles was really presented with, we, none of us would have been in this mess, but there are still these like really archaic rules for the royalty that were in play at that time. And that's how, then that's how you get royal mistresses, right? You want to, you want to play, you want to play old fashioned games. You're going to win old fashioned prizes. Like that's, that's it. It's true. <laughs> you know? And there does seem to be an irony of like a need to also see a mistress happening. Cause I mean, I think even when you're scrolling and you see that gross news that comes through on your feed, you know, I see all the time, like, oh, William has a mistress, Kate mm-hmm. Middleton embarrassed at a party because he brings his side piece. And it's yeah. like, what is this that like we need to see mm-hmm. that kind of betrayal happening too? Yeah. And it's really interesting because the way that we kind of treat royalty now is so um, we are, we are like, uh, we're still obsessed. Right. Um, But we're obsessed with it now in the same way that we are with kind of like any other form of celebrity, I would argue. Mm -hmm. But we want them to be like Disney celebrities. Right. So we want it. We want it to be like Cinderella or something like that. So we do kind of have a desire to kind of really prod and poke at their love lives. Um, and you know, they've got messy, complex love lives like we all do. Um, only they're under a much higher level of scrutiny. Um, and you kind of have to comport yourself in a particularized way that whole time. And, but yeah, we kind of, we do really like it, don't we? Um, and it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure why we, we want it so bad. I think that like part of the reason we were quite obsessed with, uh, you know, William and his side piece, I think is that, um, you know, we're also like really taking sides with the princes at the moment and things like that. And so, you know, we want to yeah. be like, ha ha, he's not even a good husband, you know, like in, in this sort of thing, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's always right. used as a point, a bigger point towards mm-hmm. something. Yeah, where it's like, uh, and but it is quite interesting too because uh, so here um, in the UK where things are a highly pro William and Kate, like it's mm-hmm. just it, it, and and these like you know I can say this to you and you'll be like yeah sure no you've got to just go to the grocery store and like see the magazine covers it's absolutely bonkers uh, and uh, and like they they love it they love it and they're always like oh Kate looking beautiful and then they'll be all like Megan is evil and and, and 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 there's like this specific thing where they're like oh she's kind of like bewitched Harry and there's like they yes. they they're like the fact that Harry is very clearly in love with her and is kind of like doing what she is like played as a weakness. Um, you know, it's, it's specifically like you hear the term pussy whipped get thrown uh-huh. around very uh-huh. often. And it's like, oh, well, if he he shouldn't um, love and care about his wife to this degree, it's kind of like is sort of the thing where because they're like, well, it's, it's simply not royal, is it? You know, it, it like a real a real prince would sit here and let uh, the, the press kind of like badger his wife to death. Like, you know, he saw happen with his mother. You know, yeah. like, and that's and that's just kind of the royal way of it. You know, so we're we're still doing this thing where we're like, this royal marriage is unseemly because they love each other, right? That is fascinating. I've I've never thought of even like the the bewitched thing. Like you heard that about Anne Boleyn mm. and other women throughout history uh-huh. of like he couldn't he couldn't love her. There's no way there. Has- there's no way there's no way like you couldn't just pop you couldn't just be like i rather love my wife and don't want people to say racist things to her and my children it's like no no like <laughs> there, there's something else that's going not on it here. yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's amazing it's truly amazing but it is it's pretty shocking when you dig deep enough and see that even today it is still very present and mm-hmm. recycled mm-hmm. And unexamined. Yeah, like it, it's unexamined. It's really interesting because, um, you know, ever like to a man in this country, everyone would say, you know, like how hard done by Princess mm-hmm. Diana was. And, you know, there, there's a lot of revisionist history going on about, you know, mm-hmm. how she was treated. Um, but, you know, we, we will play these same tropes out over and over and over again. You know, we didn't learn anything. That's I suppose yeah. that's the point. We never seem yeah. to. <laughs> oh, God. You know, like when, when, like when, when you know, we're allowed to be misogynist. We're like, I refuse to learn this lesson. You know, I, I would just, I would just love to keep hating women. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you yeah. Know? What lesson? What? what? No, like, no, no, right? Missed it. I- <laughs> 
I would say sort of the the final question on this role of of royal mistress in today's context, what would you like that role to be remembered for? Maybe either in a more positive light or maybe not, but just what would you say you would want people to think about when they think of this role? Um, I want them to think that these are interesting women, right? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, let's just go with interesting as opposed to kind of having to to bring morality into it. And in, in, as opposed to saying like, oh, you know, uh, monogamy should be a default and like I'm going with the religious version of this and you know these people these women are scheming like I, I'm kind of like let's go with interesting and uh, you mm -hmm. know perhaps ambitious right you know and if we if we start from there as kind of a standpoint it opens us up to kind of have a bigger look at the history of these things without all of this stuff kind of like getting in our way right we have to really make decisions where we are not colluding uh, with people in the the past to say that there there's a grander moral point to be made here um, and I think that it, it's all right to simply say, well, I find that interesting and, and move on from there without having like, why do you have to condemn someone who died 400 years ago? Calm down. You know, she, it's fine. She's not going to hurt you. Right? I mean, I suppose that like it, it is because they, they do kind of, as I say, they threaten us like it, it troubles um, our story of what history is, our story about what marriage is, our story about what relationships ought to be. So we do kind of rush to make these judgments because we're we're still making the same mistakes of the past you know as i say we've learned nothing you know we're still very misogynist we're still very distrustful of women so we want to make a judgment call uh, about these people and um, in a way that we wouldn't with men frankly thank you so much for joining me this was incredible i think this is going to be a really helpful episode because as i said i happen to do a lot of specific women coming up so it's like we need just like an episode yeah 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 no it's a really good idea to just kind of like get it on the page so that everybody knows but yeah it's been an absolute pleasure grace thank you so much eleanor